Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Marie Heilen, and my name is Morten Ries. And um, we have the following to say. The growing integration of sound art as research practice in academia is part of the practice turn in humanities and social sciences, where artistic practices and artifacts themselves becomes a form of academic inquiry. As the process of creating art represents a valid research method for gaining new knowledge, sound art pieces thus become more than mere objects for analysis. Because the research unfolds in and through the act of creating and performing art, practice is not only a methodological vehicle, but also a site of knowledge production. In this presentation, we argue that the implicit human-centered perspective that, it's, that is present in the knowledge production within artistic research prevent us from fully engaging with the objects in question. We suggest that tuning into the not, not knowing requires us to expand the perspective to encompass non-human forms of knowledge incorporated through a dark ecological line of thinking. By switching the focus to the, <clears throat> from the human perspective to that of the ob objects themselves, we suggest that knowledge production through practice and theory can be substituted by caus causality ex exploration through carpentry. From this perspective, little difference exists between how sound is perceived by the human ear and how sound is translated through copper wires, algorithms, voices, and room. Such a world in which art and other objects that we judge as belonging to the aesthetic dimension offers a glimpse into the ways in which causality operates. This world of objects makes clear that any exhaustive knowledge about the world and the things or human beings that occupies it is an illusion, and instead offers a focus on how entities behave, interact, develop, manifest, and translate through other objects. Practice-based research through sound art belongs to the emergent field of artistic research. Over the last two decades, the relationship between art and research has been discussed and unfolded in the field of artistic research. Within these traditions, art is said to contribute to academic knowledge, and conversely, academia offers knowledge that interferes with art practices, creating new areas of knowledge production. As stated by key figures in the field, artistic research have to critically respond and reflect on the existing knowledge imperative so it just does not just make art to produce knowledge or blindly apply theory as canonistic knowledge to the basis for research-driven art practice. Therefore, it is suggested that the division of art, practice, and writing theory is abandoned if artistic research is to be more than the application of theory and more than mere reflections of practice. In this understanding, art and theory are nothing more than two different forms of practice interrelated through a system of interaction and transferences. As such, the work is the research as a site of knowledge production where science and art are intertwined. Overall, these positions point to the need for critical reflectivity towards knowledge production within artistic research. Art as research, or better, the hybridization of art and research differs from just art, as art as research intend to carry out an original study about new things to enhance and contribute to what we know and understand. Thus, artistic forms of knowledge do not restrict themselves to contribute knowledge to art practice, but rather begin to develop into hybrid formations of knowledge or intervene, with, intervene and impact theoretical discourses contributing to theory construction. But what are hybrid form formations of knowledge, and thus what kind of knowledge needs to be recognized in academia when thinking in, through, and with art? Henk Borgdorf describes how this type of knowledge differs from other types of knowledge, as for example, propositional knowledge, facts, or knowledge on skills, how to make, as it is dealing with the articulation of the pre-reflective, non-conceptual content of art, as explored in phenomenology. Therefore, it is better considered not as knowledge production, but directed at not knowing or not yet knowing, or the idea that all things could be different, thereby inviting and leading to unfinished thinking. 
To Catherine Bush, this not knowing or not yet knowing is coined wild knowledge, encompassing the unexpected, spontaneous, and involuntary. Artistic research is thus characterized by the fact that the actual object of research is still undetermined, and therefore, I quote, the knowledge of certain facts not being yet reduced into up, uh, concepts, end quote. Bush quotes Michel Foucault when explaining how art is valid as a different form of knowledge, quote, not showing the invisible, but rather showing the extent to which the invisibility of the visible is invisible. End quote. In this way, artistic research could enable us to refer to that which cannot be articulated within the respective fields of knowledge. For Timothy Morton, objects are ontologically riven between their withdrawn essence and their appearance for other objects. Withdrawal is understood as an unbreakable encryption irreducible to perception or meaning, which makes it impossible for any knowledge to replace the object in question. All objects are simultaneously fragile and autonomous, as they possess a potentially infinite progress in which they can be unfolded. As objects withdraw, no object or part of an object can have direct access to any other object. This is because objects are deeper than their appearance to the human mind, but also deeper than their relations to other objects. So if it's impossible to gain any knowledge about the real objects, how do we then proceed? If knowledge about reality is inaccessible in our knowledge society, how can we then justify what we as academics are doing? We start by examining the objects that we engage with, and, just, uh, <clears throat> and thus the rift becomes central to the development of an, of an expanded form of causality, which becomes integrated with a new view on aesthetics, claiming that causality is the aesthetic dimension produced by the interaction between objects. Within the realm of sound, the rift can be understood as the medium of mediation between the essence of the sound and its appearance, which is meaningful in relation to how the speed of sound changes depending on what material it is mediated by. This makes it impossible to grasp the essence of a sound without its mediation, suggesting that it's impossible for the sound object to be without its mediation as it would then be reduced to appearance only. If this mediation is happening in air, making sound acoustically audible to humans or in the flux line strength within the tape recorder is secondary in this context. The important issue is the awareness regarding this rift within the sound object. The aesthetic experience is then not solely something that occurs within our human mind, but instead expanded to incorporate all causal events taking place in and between objects. This leads to a non-human phenomenology in which there is very little difference between how a shadow is perceived by a light sensor and by a human. Causality and the aesthetic dimension does not take place in a space and time container that has already been established beforehand. Instead, it pours or radiates from the tensions of the rift between essence and appearance establishing the notion of interobjectivity in which objects space and time each other as verbs, not unfolding in time and residing in space. Through this line of thinking, art becomes a collaboration between humans and non-humans, and thus an important way to explore the rifts and attunements between objects. The developed perspective on causal aesthetics implies that it's impossible to observe the aesthetic effect from an outside position a conceptualization that calls for a new way of engaging with the sound art pieces, an engagement that tunes the various objects involved, not trying to reduce consistent knowledge from them, but rather investigate them through a specific practical engagement. This type of, of investigation could be unfolded through Borgdorf, con, Borgdorf's conceptualization of how knowledge and understanding in artistic research needs to be expanded in order to incorporate the wild knowledge of practice-based research. He proposes the terms insight and comprehension as replacements. But these notions imply a correlationist understanding of the world, as it, as it is insight and comprehension from a human perspective. The promise of artistic research is both to unravel our intimate and distant relations to the world, proposing how the unpredictable, non-representable, sensual and concealed can supplement traditional scientific types of proportional knowledge. But as long as the artistic engagement 
is still reflected in a colonialist framework. This presentation claims that a hybridization of art and research is difficult to claim, is difficult to achieve, sorry. If we accept the premise that the aesthetic is the causal, then the practice of art becomes not just the candy on the surface of the world. This again makes it possible for artistic research to fulfill Borgdorf's claim that artistic research, and I quote, enhances our awareness of the pre-reflective nearness of things as well as our epi epistemological distance from them, end quote. Therefore, we propose an engagement conceptualized through both Timothy Morton's notion of tuning and Ian Bogus's construction of carpentry. The notion of carpentry as conceptualized by Ian Bogus is described as the philosophical practice of making things. As a philosophical lab equipment, carpentry becomes a perspective on creative work that possesses philosophical questions. As when matter is being used, especially for philosophical use, executing what could be denoted at, as applied ontology. At the core of carpentry lies the understanding that philosophy is practice just as much as it is theory, the practice of constructing artifacts as a philosophical practice. A practice that is closely related to Morton's notion of tuning, which is described as the possibility to explore causality by creating or studying objects. According to Morton, tuning must be considered as more than just a way to standardize musical intervals. Tuning is a method uh, methodology for approaching the very essence of a causality and acting out phenomenology. Tuning in an object-oriented perspective becomes a way of demonstrating how all objects can affect each other in different situations. This understanding referenced the basic acoustical understanding of tuning as the interference occurring when two frequencies collide. Carpentry and tuning can thus be used to tell us something about art's epistemic character, because it foregrounds that knowing is not about seeing from above or outside. Knowing is a matter of interacting. Knowing is not bound or closed practice, but an ongoing performance of the world. Thus, the role of practice outlined here then becomes a way of attuning to the inconsistency of objects as a tuning relationship that collapses the subject-object division, giving rise to a sense of coexistence and connection to other objects. And a tuning that is slightly out of phase, recognizing its inconsistency and fragility, and thereby also its own uncanny strangeness. The transducers start to Explore fragile tuning relationships in and between objects such as human voice, microphone, cover wires, TC, helicon, algorithms, bus loop, pedal, digital to analog converters, TDA 7297 amplifier chip, overhead projector, and transparent paper. Through preparation involving the use of transducers, it is possible to transform the body of the projector and transparent paper into speakers amplifying my voice through the microphone. The semantic meaning of the text printed on the paper is transformed into a resonating entity that vibrates and affects nearby objects. The transducers are doing carpentry investigating the relational character of fragile objects, sounds, vibrations, paper. Placed on the overhead projector 
are the moving coil actuator type, a device that transforms one kind of energy, electrical current, into another phys physical movements via electromagnetic induction. The coil tunes to the electrical current flowing through the copper wires connecting, connecting the output of the amplifier to the transducer. It pays special attention to the way in which current flows through and around its iron core, creating a magnetic field that works against and with the permanent magnets. The, flow, the moving coil tries to position itself according to the flowing current that enters its sensory, sensory apparatus and to balance itself between the strength of the magnetic field and the torsional force in the spring that facilitates its are tuned to a variety of different signal types. It is trying its best to keep up with the seemingly endless stream of electrons hitting its metal and copper eardrums as it, as it reacts to even the tiniest, almost inaudible changes of electrical current. The coil rapidly digests its impressions and begins to give voice to its own version of the current, a voice based on and inspired by the electrons' movement within the copper wire. The coil makes its own song, not a cheap cover version, but rather a version that expresses the coil's sense of what it is like to be a moving coil. Transducer is an interesting object to explore aesthetics as causality, what Harman calls vicarious causation, because we never hear the transducer itself. Neither do the human ears, the plastic structure of the overhead projector, nor the transparent paper ever grasp the essence of the sounding transducer. Through this line of thinking, the transducer is not a transparent medium that smoothly communicates semantic meaning to nearby objects but instead something that translates, alters, devour, converts, demolish, rework, and consume reductionistic knowledge in the process of creating time and space. The proposed perspectives indicate how artistic research and other practice-based form of research could imply an anti-reductionist attuning approach to the inconsistency of objects, recognizing the fragility of the rift in and between objects. We need critical reflection, which through action becomes concerned with one li one's life and with the lives of other others. But this, this approach forces us to coexist with the vast plenum of non-human objects that help us explore our own fragility and rift within ourselves.
Doing so collapses the belief that we can distance ourselves from the world and consequently our engagement with objects becomes not a matter of producing knowledge about the world, but, but instead an ongoing process of not knowing or listening. Thank you. Thank you. We have some time for questions now. Reactions. Um, yeah, I thought it was actually, I was very interested in the way that you were combining um, tuning and carpentry, and I, I thought that was an interesting approach. Is that, is that, can, can everyone hear? Yeah. Sounds good, okay. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> and also kind of reminded me a little bit about, of Karen Barad, a little bit, the way you were talking about interaction. But, um, but actually what I did want to say was that um, I, I wonder whether it would be interesting when you look at when you're looking at artistic research and art, or you say, let's say artistic research by artists, whether it would be interesting to look at the situation in sort of completely visual art, which um, which I think is interesting because um, I think a lot of the artists who do research in you know, the visual research, visual artists, they, they seem to be considered. I mean, it seems to be more art. You know, than research. I mean, even though they're actually doing research, which sometimes questions, you know, sort of academic, normal academic research, let's say, <laughs> they, they're they're um, they're still considered as artists and not as researchers. So, so I think you you seem to have reached the kind of intermediate position with the tuning and the carpentry, a sort of intermediate position between art and research. But I I'm wondering how does that um, you know, which I think is interesting, but maybe the reality is more that that these kind of couplings are considered more as as art. You want to respond? Yeah. Um. Yeah. Um, thank you for your question. Um, the way that we um, think about um, art and research is basically, we, we think of them as the same thing. So for us, there is no difference between conducting, uh, conducting research and doing art. Because, and I think that you have a point in that sound as a, as a medium, as a, as a way of expression, is, is a really good um, way of engaging with the world because, um, everything is, or you could claim that everything is vibrating and everything is somehow affecting other things. And it's, it's the same, I mean, this, this kind of um, deep uh, construction or deep uh, unfolding of these very simple like uh, translations that is happening here, for instance, it's a really good way of, of staging these inconsistencies uh, that we feel is both is present in in, um, in the in the art that we make, but also uh, it's very important when trying to discuss about new types of sound ontologies. Um, so, at least for us, our perspective, it's there's no different in difference in how we work as artists and how we work as as researchers. I don't know if that that's really an answer. Yeah, I have words. Yeah. I just have a small comment as well. It's because it's also sort of political, uh, this way of using other words than, than knowledge production, at least in the Danish context, is, is right now a discussion how you can you know, make artistic research and practice and also like uh, many um, ways of trying to use practice as like a, a sort of like a application where you have a workshop for a few hours and then you have done the practice and that's that yeah sorry that's <laughs> rude but but uh, i mean in that sense it's also a way to say that, that the knowledge production in, in itself is question questionable as like an outcome of whatever so yeah thank, thank you 
Yeah, well, actually, perhaps I, my question wasn't very clear, but what I really meant was that um, I think it's sort of almost, in a sense, too easy to, to equate, you know, like art and research. And, um, you know, like, for instance, if you look at Deleuze, who is, everybody's quoting him also on how art and research can be very similar. And so I was trying to see if perhaps there was another position that might be a little bit different, because I find that it's too, yeah, as I said, easy and in very common. But the, I totally agree that was also what I was trying to say, but in a not very good way. Thank you for uh, the talk and the, the act, mainly. As, as I see, it doesn't mean to c convey your ideas through artistic means. I think this, that's the strength of what you were doing. And it was very interesting to me also because this, uh, I do more or less uh, engage in the question that you raised myself in my PhD, which is practice based. So I embrace a lot of things that you said, but I also deny a lot of things that you said at the same time. That I want to push you on some critical issue here that I uh, support and deny at the same time, <laughs> which is the fact that art. Art practice is a research, it's a fact. No doubt about that. If there is any discussion in society about that, that's the problem of society. But the question is, <laughs> the question is how you or me or anybody else who engage in artistic practice gain a certain knowledge and how, to, how it, it is, if any, uh, transferable, right? Because we know that under the uh, practice itself, or the, even the um, experience of, of, of the work, or the practice, uh, you have a subjective knowledge. Now how this knowledge is, can be qualitatively and quantitatively, um, how do you say? Um, no, like there's something that is coming together. Um, Merge? Combined? Combined. Yeah, yeah. And how, and, and let's say if that already happened, which is a real doubt, how can we transfer it over one to the other? And if we succeed to do that, then we can go to the chair of the sciences and tell him, oh, don't cut our bunny back. We still can contribute to knowledge of the humanity and claim it back. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you ask about how you can transfer knowledge. So you have to like, you say that there is different knowledge paradigms and you want to know how to transfer knowledge from one paradigm to the other. Is that more or less ish? No? Yeah, anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the whole, I mean, the whole idea of using these terms, wild knowledge, and not, not yet knowing, is, is very closely related to um, Graham Harmon's way of thinking about knowledge, which, I mean, he has this metaphor of the, the third table, which is the table that um, we as artists are engaged, with, are engaged with, and not the the table described by physics, or the table in cultural context, like a, something that you put something on. Um, so, so, I mean, he, he, he uses this metaphor of the, of the third table. And, and then, I mean, some of the, the knowledge that you gain by engaging with the third table is then, I mean, the whole point is that it, you can't really translate it into the other two tables because, because then you reduce it. So there's this whole, whole no, notion of reductionism, uh, which is also, I mean, then it becomes sort of like a more political statement because you reduce the world to something like a one sentence. Um, and of course you can, I mean, when you, when you do stuff with a transducer, for instance, you learn, you learn about uh, what is current, how does matter alter different kinds of matter, um, and I mean, you could condense that into some kind of more formalistic, reductionistic type of knowledge. But I think that it's, it's the way that we collect knowledge 
it's, it's really, really crucial that you stay in the third table. And then, of course, you, you meet all these more political aspects of cut, uh, people are cutting down your funding because you're not condensing your knowledge into facts. Uh, um, but as long as it's, I mean, stay at the third table for as long as you can and then um, at least for our, our perspective, we we um, we get something new from this engagement. I mean, we we come up with knowledge that could be claimed to be reductionist, but we we sort of have our own take on it because we are so much engaged with the third table for so long. Um, I don't know if that really answers the question. So I'm, what I'm saying is that it's. I think it's. I mean, from a theoretical point of view, it's impossible to, to translate the different types of knowledge. So that's, that's also a fact. <laughs> but it's more, it's a, it's a practical, political thing. Then it becomes that instead, where you need to condense it into something you can write on paper and put in a journal, and the university gets money because you publish in a level two journal and so on. Thank you for your talk. Um, so research, the way that I've always understood research is that there's this possibility that research might fail, right? So if I'm researching some topic, you know, if I'm in the archive, I mean, I may not know exactly what I'm looking for, but I may have certain assumptions and I may or may not find documents and artifacts that help me justify that hypothesis, but it often fails, right? Research has dead ends. Um, here's my question about the relationship between OOO and research. It seems to me that OOO, the kind of orthodox object-oriented ontology that's, that you are subscribing to here, has already made a number of claims that are that there was no possible kind of philosophical argument against, right? There is a rift between essence and appearance, and essences are always withdrawn, and there is no way that essences are ever going to be known in some sense, right? And so doesn't this mean that all of the research that you're doing always ends up in a certain kind, it ends up begging a certain set of premises that have already been established from the very beginning. When you place the transducer on the overhead projector, and suddenly now I'm watching supposedly the transducer enjoy itself, this is a conclusion that we could have already gotten from reading Morton and Harmon ahead of time. So my question, this is a very genuine question. It's one from, I mean, I'm kind of, I don't, I don't want to come off as antagonistic here. I'm actually really curious about this. Um, what's learned? What is the research? It, how is this not just a demonstration of a set of essentially religious claims about the split between <laughs> essence and appearance? Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, I need to answer this question. Uh, <laughs> that, that's a really, really good uh, question and, and something that we have been talking about uh, for a while now. I think that, I mean, um, the, the really short uh, answer to this is that it's, it's because it, it, is, it, it needs to be demonstrated. It needs to be exemplified, this religion. It needs to be exemplified. Uh, and, then there, and, and why it needs to be exemplified, then you could put all kinds of more like political, uh, ecological, whatever, f arguments in why we need to care for other things, um, humans and so on. Uh, so, I mean, the, the really short answer is that it, it needs to be exemplified and it needs to be, it needs to be out there where people are. So it, it, it needs, we need, as artists, as, as re researchers, we need to engage with the world and tell people that things interact and pe things translate each other. So, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right in saying that you could just read this book and then whatever is, is, is in that book, you could just, that, that does, that's the same what's going on here. But we need to exemplify it and we need, we need to show it. Yeah, 
I'll keep it. I'll keep it short. And it was just a. Um, it was just a sort of add add to that because. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think um, there's a, a, a passage in the beginning of the ecological thought where Timothy Morton uh, says, uh, you know, he admits, he says, think, actually thinking and digesting these concepts, thinking the ecological thought, thinking object-oriented ontology is hard. It's really difficult. Uh, and he says, because it's so hard, we should expect art to show us the way. Um, and... Uh, where it's really exciting to me to see you do this through sound, because I think uh, a place where Timothy Moore perhaps falls down is that he, uh, he, he talks a lot in various places in his, his books about the importance of, of art in uh, embodying the concepts that he's talking about. Um, but then he usually tends to fall back on his own specialist area of romantic literature to, to try to demonstrate these things. Whereas actually I think sound perhaps has more potential to embody the concepts he's talking about. So it's really exciting to me to see, or to hear you uh, exemplifying these concepts through sound. So yeah, that's more of a comment, but thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm really glad that you say that. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think time is up. Yep. So I will say thank you. <laughs> to more